Well, hey, how's it going, Trace? And we are so thankful that you are joining us. Now, if you happen to be watching with us online and it is your first time, we would ask that you would use the hashtag new to Trace as we would love to get connected with you. On top of that, if you're able to share our content so that we can ultimately get the gospel out there, that would be a huge help to us. So make sure that you like, comment, and share this post. On top of that, if you happen to be joining with us in person, we want you to know that your safety is our number one priority. So we are making sure that we are going above and beyond with our cleaning procedures and everything on top of that. As well, we are also, as you can see, wearing masks a lot of the time. And so it's kind of like a restaurant style. So once you get to your seat, feel free to take those masks off as you engage with us in worship and in conversation. And then finally, if you want your next steps here at Trace, you can do it in person, out in the lobby. All you have to do is find somebody with a blue shirt that has next steps written on it, or you can download our app, which is available on the Google Play Store and the App Store. Uh, from our next steps, you can get connected to a group, you can request prayer, you can give, and you can access all the content that we have online as well. That's all that we've got. Thank you very much for watching, and we hope that you enjoy the service. by worshiping Christ this morning.
Well, thanks again for joining us here in worship this morning. We have a guest worship leader with us. Her name is Gina. Can you guys just show your appreciation for her? Amen, as we continue this morning.
hands out in front of you. If you don't feel comfortable, that's okay too. Maybe just close your eyes. Jesus, we welcome you. We trust you. We turn our attention to you. Turn over our anxiety, turn over our guilt, our pain. We turn it all over to you, the one who is powerful, the one who is good. We worship you today.
and the power that comes from saying your name, singing your name. Just pray right now if you maybe walked in here today with anxiety or heaviness, guilt, shame, just that you would feel right now the presence of Jesus. Bring peace, bring joy, bring goodness this morning. Good morning, Trace. My name is Daisha. I am the director of Connections here. It is so good to be worshiping you with you. I love to be a part of a church where uh, you can stop pretending, and it's it's good to be doing that with you here this morning and in spirit online. Um, so I just have a couple of announcements for you guys. Next week, we're celebrating something big. Celebrate with me for a second. Trace turns four next week. Can I get a hand? It's exciting. So we're going to have a big party um, here in the parking lot. After the first service ends, we'll start the party, but we'll continue it on even after this 11 o'clock service. So feel free to stay for hot dogs and bouncers and yard games out in the parking lot. We just want to celebrate that birthday. Also, as a part of our celebration, we are collecting masks for our community. Uh, two organizations, Springs Rescue Mission serves our homeless and also Mark Twain Elementary. So we need kids masks as well. Uh, so there's a table out in the lobby. Bring masks next week. Week. Our goal is 4,000 masks in honor of our four-year anniversary, so join us in doing that. In a couple of weeks on September 20th, we have the Be a Trace class. If you've been coming to Trace for a while or if you're a guest with us, this is your next step if you haven't done it already. It's a great place to hear about the mission, culture, vision of Trace and find out how you can take ownership in it. And uh, speaking of, of just getting connected, taking next steps, we have three things here that we call the Trace Experience. We feel like if you do these things, you'll really uh, experience growth in your faith and growth in your relationships with others at Trace. So those three things are to gather together, get in a group, and give to the mission. There's some images in the lobby that represent those three things to remind you. So uh, gather, get, give. Gather, get, give. Can you guys say that with me? Ready? Gather, get, give. Remember those three things. If you need to take some next steps in those areas, I'd invite you to join us in the lobby uh, to talk about that at next steps. So pray with me over the morning and, and we'll continue on. God, we are so grateful for your presence here with us this morning uh, and, and everywhere we gather. And uh, we just ask that you would be with our time. Let us um, focus on you. Let us leave things aside that we need to so that we can hear from you this morning. Thank you for, for giving us this church, this space, this online experience. Everywhere we are, God, we, we bring ourselves to you this morning and, and ask you to, to show us what you have. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. What's up, Trace Church? Uh, it's really good to be here with you today. Uh, really fast, I just want to say welcome to any of you guys that are joining us for the very first time this morning, whether a friend invited you, maybe you saw our street signs out there, or maybe you've been watching online for several weeks now, but finally decided to join us in person. Whatever the case, we're honored to have you as guests with us this morning. We're so excited to have you today. I uh, also just want to take a moment and give a brief shout out to all of you that are joining us online. Uh, our team has been working incredibly hard to give you a great online experience so that you don't miss out on what God is doing here at Trace Church. So I hope you're sitting somewhere comfortable. I hope you're enjoying your morning. We're so glad to have you as a part of the conversation today. Uh, my name is Josiah, and I have the opportunity to be one of the pastors here at Trace. Uh, more specifically, I get to work with our high school and middle school students here at Trace. They always keep me on my toes. But uh, let's just be honest for a second. If you're a student in the room, like 2020 sucks, okay? It's not great. Uh, I was just talking to somebody about reverse senioritis, that seniors right now are more excited to go back to school than they are to be done with school, which I thought was interesting. Um, but school is hard. 
Like we're not getting to see our friends near as much. We're probably fighting with our parents a lot more. And after only a couple weeks of school, we're probably already ready to be done. Uh, But as a church, we want to remove obstacles for people to get to Jesus. Uh, That includes here with you all, that includes in the other room with our kids, but it also includes different nights of the week with our students. And so if you are a student, if you have a student, if you know a student, uh, please come talk to me after this. I would love the opportunity to meet you, love the opportunity to get the students connected to what God is doing here at Trace. So today, as you saw, we are starting a brand new series, which I am very excited about. And this series uh, is called Masks. And I saw most people dressing appropriately for this. But like if you would have told me last year that this time this year, I'd be spending a majority of my time planning things that are probably going to get canceled and a lot of time running back to my car because I forgot my mask. Uh, Not only would I have not believed you, but I probably would have argued with you uh, because that's kind of the person that I am. Like who would have thought this is where we would be at this time this year? Like it makes me want to go back to 2019 and revoke my New Year's celebration because like 2020 is not worth celebrating. But I hope at the end of this year that we throw one heck of a party to say, you know, we survived 2020. But we've changed and we've grown so much over this last year from learning about a company called Zoom to having the world's longest spring break to even, you know, the tinge of guilt or the tinge of fear that we might have when we gather together in places like this, wondering, you know, what could happen. But perhaps the greatest change to our everyday life are these things right here, right? Masks. That because of a mask mandate here in Colorado, we have to take one of these things with us basically everywhere that we go. And I recognize that for some of you guys, like this causes some unrest. I understand that sometimes these are uncomfortable. I understand that sometimes these things can make us feel uneasy. But if there's one thing we can agree on, I hope it's this, that during this season of mass, during this season of change, there's been a lot of really, really good humor that's come out of this. And so I just found a couple of these that I'd like to share with you. This one came from someone in our church. It says this, so if masks become permanent, do we have to spend money on braces? Because that seems kind of pointless now. And I thought that was funny. Or maybe for Star Wars fans, be like the Mandalorian, never take your mask off in front of others. This is the way. Thought that was good. Or maybe for the parents, I haven't heard of this happening yet, but I know it's only a matter of time. Uh, This isn't the mask you wore to school this morning. No, this one's way cooler. I traded mine to Taylor, who traded with Hunter. Like, I know that's going to happen. Just a good old-fashioned mask swap there. But whether you see it or not, masks have become a part of the new normal in our society today. And while some of them are uncomfortable, some of us are unfamiliar with them, there are some masks that we wear that we're a little bit more comfortable with, that we do like to wear a little bit more often, that we're a little bit more familiar with. Maybe for you, it's the mask that you wear when you're around different people. You know, whether it's the girl or the guy that you like, or maybe it's uh, the mask you wear when you're around your in-laws, or maybe it's the mask that you wear whenever you come to a building like this, that you walk into a church and this is unfamiliar territory and you don't know what to do, so you put on a mask. Or maybe for you, it's the mask that we can sometimes wear as followers of Jesus, that we say one thing and we do another. Whatever the case, we all have different masks that we like to wear. And today, uh, I'd like to talk to you not about a mask that looks like this, but about the mask that looks like this right here. A smile. A smile. Because far too often, we walk around smiling on the outside while struggling on the inside. And this is a place, we want this to be a church, we want this to be the kind of place where you can stop pretending. And so today and over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about what it means to live a bold life, yes, but also how to live an authentic life, free from fake smiles, free from uh, metaphorical masks, free from pretending. And before I go any further today, I'd just like to preface by saying I recognize that some of the things that we're going to talk about today hit pretty close to home for some of you that we're going to talk about what it means to struggle on the inside. And I recognize that some of you deal with anxiety, depression, and other clinical mental illnesses. And I'm not going to stand up here and pretend that I'm equipped to talk about all those different things. Because I know those things can have a profound effect on your social, emotional, your spiritual life. But today, I, I am a pastor, and so I would like to speak at these things from a spiritual perspective. So in the essence of not pretending, uh, I'm not a licensed counselor. I'm not a trained psychologist. I'm not a mental health specialist. Very simply, I'm just a 24-year-old guy that has some experience smiling on the outside, 
while struggling on the inside. And I'd just like to share some of my thoughts with you today. So when I was in college, uh, I had a professor that asked uh, our class this question right here. What do you think is the biggest lie told in church? What do you think is the biggest lie told in church? And so I sat there and I thought for a while while some of my peers began to answer, you know, one of them said, you got to do more good things than bad things if you want to go to heaven. That's not true. That's, not, that's something, though, that comes up in these kind of contexts. Oh, or then another kid shouted out, God hates gay people. That that's a lie that is told, and sometimes it's referred to in churches. It's just not true. Then another kid spoke up and said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But he added the caveat, because I don't care how much Christ is in me, I'm not going to be able to bench 300 pounds at the end of today. When it finally came to my turn, I, I looked at my professor and I said, uh, I'm praying for you. And I think the biggest lie told in church is I'm praying for you. The amount of times that I've heard that and people not actually prayed for me, it would probably astound you. Um, but he looked at all of us and he said, no, that's not, that's not it. No, the biggest lie I told in church is this phrase right here. I'm good. I'm good. That several times, every single Sunday, countless people flood into churches. They're given like a half-hearted greeting and they're asked how they're doing and you know what they say? I'm good. And guys, I'm no different than you all. Even this morning, several times over, I've caught myself saying this to people rather than telling them how I'm really doing. That oftentimes I see this in churches. Like I've watched moms come into church with a morning that was absolute chaos. Like their hair is plastered sideways. They're holding the kid that's screaming. The other kid's crying because the other kid's screaming. And they walk into church and they've got like breakfast smeared all over their brand new outfit that they got from Target for church. And they walk into church and someone asks them how they're doing. You know what they say? I'm good. No, you're not. <laughs> like, look at what's going on around you. You're not okay. Or, you know, I've seen families where both of them lose their jobs. And they're struggling financially and they're wondering how they're going to make ends meet. And they're wondering how they're going to pay for their kids' college. And they walk into a church and someone says, hey, how are you doing? And you know what they say? I'm good. And it's like, if I were in your shoes, I probably wouldn't feel the same way. I've even sat across the table from students that have recently attempted to take their own life. And although their cheeks are still damp, their eyes still wet from crying. You ask them how they're doing, and you know what they say? I'm good. I'm good. And like I said, I'm no different than anybody else. That oftentimes I find myself saying something that does not actually reflect how I really feel. That listen, if you're anything like me, your interactions with people go something like this. If something goes wrong, students, maybe you fail a chemistry test. Maybe one of you, your car breaks down. Maybe somebody ate the snack that you were very clearly saving for later. Like something goes wrong. Or maybe on a more serious note, someone you love. They pass away. Maybe you caught him cheating on you. Maybe both of you lost your jobs. And in that moment, what we have a tendency to do is rather than being vulnerable, rather than being transparent, rather than stop pretending, we tend to put on a mask. We tend to smile. We tend to act like everything's okay. We fake it as long as we know how, knowing full well we're probably never going to make it. And in that moment, we mask how we're really doing with how we want people to think we're really doing. And we deceive ourselves that our outward appearance doesn't match our internal struggle. Yet listen, this dilemma is not one that's just confined to 21st century Americans, that actually we see this happen all throughout Scripture. People who seem to be succeeding on the outside, smiling on the outside, but really struggling on the inside. And this is nowhere more true than with King David of the Old Covenant. You see, in Jewish history, King David, he's this hero. He, he's this hero-like character, this Hercules-type figure. He's characterized by conquest and expanding the borders of Israel. And he's this incredible king that's defined as a man chasing after God's own heart. And he's a warrior and a musician and a poet and a shepherd and a king. He's got everything going for him. That from every angle of his life, every facet of his life, he looks like the archetype for success. But even though this is true, David wore a mask. That oftentimes David put on a smile. David pretended. 
Because while all these achievements are true of him, he still goes on to write things like this in Psalm 113. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day and have sorrow in my heart? Anybody been there? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. Guys, that doesn't sound like a successful person. That doesn't sound like someone who's good. That with all of his success, with all of his achievements, achievements, David often found himself smiling on the outside while struggling on the inside. And listen, I don't think we're any different here today. That at one point or another, we all like to pretend. We all like to make people think that we're doing okay when on the inside, we really aren't. And I think for all of us, it comes back to the fact that somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, we picked up this lie and we started believing this lie right here that it's not okay to not be okay. That it's not okay to not be okay. And we all do this for different reasons. If you're anything like me, maybe for you it's pride. That you associate vulnerability with weakness. And so if you share with people how you're really doing, you know, they're gonna think you're weak. They're gonna think you're not up to the challenge. They're gonna think you're not up to the task. And so you stuff it down, you ignore it. Or maybe for you, it's guilt. That you have some sort of misplaced guilt in your life. That you think your problems aren't big enough to talk about. Or that you think you shouldn't share these things with other people or you don't wanna bother people with what's really going on in your life. And so you stuff it down, you ignore it. Or maybe for you, it's shame. That you've made some mistakes in your life. You've done some things that you're really just not proud of. And you know if you show, share those with other people, then they have the ability to use them against you, and you may have even experienced that. And so for whatever reason, you take those things and you stuff them down and you ignore it. Whatever the case, we all have a tendency to believe the lie that it's not okay to not be okay. And like I said, I'm no different than you guys. And if I could be transparent with you, I would tell you that I've spent a lot of time in my life pretending. I've spent a lot of time in my life wearing a smile while struggling on the inside. And if I were to be really honest with you, I would tell you that I had one of these moments actually this past summer. And listen, something you need to know about me is this. I love this church. I love Trace Church. And it's not just because I work here, I promise. I love this church. Like I, I really hope you realize how blessed you are to be a part of a church with so many gifted, talented people on the same staff going in the same direction. Like it's one of the reasons that my wife and I wanted to come and move here because we wanted to be a part of something like that. But because there's so many talented people on staff here, one of the things that I often have a tendency to do is I put an unnecessary amount of pressure on myself to perform at a level uh, that I think the rest of the team is at, that Tyler and Aaron and the rest of them. But listen, my entire life, I've never had a problem saying no to people that ask me to help them. That if anything, sometimes I've had a problem saying yes. I've never had a problem with my work-life balance. It's been something that I've prided myself on. But ever since I've been here, because of the pressure I put on myself, I've done my absolute best to accept any opportunity that comes my way. Rarely turning down a challenge to be better. Rarely ever saying no to anyone. For the most part, if I can be honest, like it hasn't affected me a ton. That is until this past summer, one week this summer. That seemed like all this pressure, all this responsibility kind of culminated in the same week for me. Uh, that every week I was planning events for middle school and high school students, trying to manage the tension of not doing enough because of coronavirus, but also uh, making sure we had something for our students. And there were parents on both sides of the fence that thought I was doing one or the other. I had people in this church that I was counseling, people that I was trying to help get through a hard season. I had students uh, that were really struggling with this season, trying to make sense of everything that I was walking with. Aaron's always been incredible, gener incredibly generous to me uh, with allowing me to come up here and preach and share some thoughts uh, with you all, and I never want to be ungrateful for that. He's given me way more opportunities than I deserve. But at the same time, I was getting in a ton of fights with my wife, Jessica, day after day. And it all kind of came to a T when a trip that I was really looking forward to, a trip I was really looking forward to, got canceled. 
And in that moment, all the pressure in my life, all the responsibility that I had, it very quickly turned to rage in my life. And I'm not just talking like, oh, I was a little bit upset, or oh, I was a little bit frustrated. Now, I remember driving down the street that day thinking in my head, like, I dare somebody to cut me off right now. Like, I dare somebody to cut me off right now. Like, I've been driving this white girl wagon for far too long. Like, make my day, get me a new car, cut me off, see what happens. And in my life, that anger, that rage turned to a word that I, I do not like to use to describe myself. It's not one I pull out often. I know Aaron used it a couple weeks ago, but it's this word right here. It's depressed. For a couple days there, I was a depressed mess. Couldn't sleep at night, didn't want to eat, didn't want to do anything. And through nothing that anyone here has ever said to me, through nothing that this staff has done to me, through nothing uh, that has anything to do with the culture here at Trace, I thought in my head, I can't tell anybody about this. I can't tell anybody about this. Because this is much too big of a deal. And I thought to myself, I'm Josiah freaking Weiss. Like, I don't get stressed. I'm a happy person most of the time. I definitely don't get depressed. No, I lead too many people. I help people that are depressed. I don't, I don't get depressed. And so I started pretending. I put on a smile. I acted like everything was okay on the outside. And I just kept working harder and harder and harder. And it wasn't until I had some very intentional conversations with some people here at this church, very intentional conversations with some people on staff, very intentional conversations with uh, some of my family members, with my wife, I started to recognize the root of all of this. Like I said, somewhere along the way, deep down, I started to believe a lie. That it's not okay to not be okay. That it's not okay to not be okay. And for the person that needs to hear this this morning, I need you to hear me very clearly. That's what that is. It's a lie. But listen, it is okay to not be okay. It's okay for you to not be okay. This is a place you can stop pretending. This is a place you should stop pretending. It's okay to not be okay. That it's okay for you to talk about the fact that your teenagers are not like model citizens like the rest uh, of your friends' kids. That they're rebellious that you're having a hard time as a parent. It's okay for you to talk about the fact that your marriage has been struggling for months now, that you fight all the time and you don't know how this thing is gonna play out. Guys, it's okay for you to walk into a building like this, a church, and say, I don't know about this whole Jesus thing. I don't know if God is real real or not. It doesn't seem like he's listening to me. I've got some questions. I've got some things that I'm struggling with. But listen, it's okay for you to not be okay. We just don't want to stay that way. We just don't want to stay that way. And so what do you do when you find yourself in this place? What do you do when you find yourself in this space? What do you do when you're not okay? Really fast, I'd just like to give you three things, three very practical steps that you can take when you find yourself in this space and you recognize that you're not okay on the inside. And the first one is this. Slow down. Slow down. Guys, the pace of the American life is only getting faster. With an increase in modern technology, people are on the clock more, answering emails much later than they should be, going to bed long after the sun goes down. An interesting statistic that I found this week was that over the course of the last 20 years, as people, our pace of walking has increased by 10%. Meaning this, that we are rushing more and more to get to the next meeting. We're rushing more and more to get through the grocery store and get home. We are rushing more and more to get through life and trying to make the most of our time. But one of the things I've always found interesting about Jesus is this. Although his calendar was always full, although he was an incredibly busy man, we never see Jesus running to his next appointment. That although he had the demands of ministry, he had people coming to him and it was literally a life or death situation although people were beating him to the places that he would next preach. We never see Jesus running to his next appointment. We never see Jesus buckle under the pressure. No, if anything, he does the opposite. It says this in Luke chapter five. But Jesus often, it's an important word, Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. And often, not sometimes, not just when he needed to, 
But Jesus often took the time to slow down, to focus on what was truly important in his life. And this is nowhere more true in his life than in Luke uh, chapter 22, where Jesus is about to die. Jesus is about to go to the cross. And he knows he only has a couple hours left to live. And let's be honest in this moment, Jesus is a little bit worried. Jesus is a little bit anxious. Jesus may even be a little bit afraid of what's coming. But in this moment, what does he do? He doesn't go and take on more ministry to ignore what's going on on the inside. He he doesn't try to distract himself and simply drink the night away. He, He doesn't try to go after some other pleasure so that he can ignore what's really going on. No, what does he do? It says this in Luke chapter 22. He walked away. He withdrew about a stone's throw and he knelt down and he prayed that he withdrew, that he took the time to slow down, not to ignore what was going on in his life, not to ignore what was going on on the inside, but to deal with it head on. And I think for Jesus, it's because he understood this truth right here, that the further we try to run from our problems, the faster our problems will run us over. That the further we try to run from our problems, the faster our problems will will run us over. And look, some of us have known for a long time that something is wrong. Whether you're not sleeping at night, maybe you're just a little bit more irritable than you usually are. Maybe you're getting in fights more with your spouse or coworkers or whatever. Maybe you're just having a really, really hard time finding those small moments of joy in your life. Whatever the case You are moving at a pace, listen to me, you are moving at a pace that is unsustainable. And sooner or later, your problems are going to force you to a complete stop. And so why not take the time to intentionally slow down before it's too late? So what do you do when you're not okay? First thing we do is this, we slow down. We slow down. The second thing we do is this, we speak up. We speak up. Now, when I talk about speaking up, I'm really talking about you guys and me talking to uh, two different people. And the first one is this, talk to your father. Now, I don't mean your, your physical father. I mean uh, your heavenly father. I, I mean God. That God loves to listen to what's going on in the lives of his children. I love how Psalm 116 puts it. I love this imagery. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. I love this imagery. Because he bends down to listen. That God, he bends down to listen. That God loves to listen to you. He's always looking for opportunities to listen to you. And look, I get it. I promise I do. Sometimes it feels like our prayers aren't going anywhere. Sometimes it feels like the only response we're getting is silence. Sometimes it feels like we're in a spiritual dead zone. That maybe our problems aren't a big enough deal for God to listen to. And if that's you, I would say this. That if it's big enough to worry about, It's big enough to pray about. That if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about that God is desperate to hear what's going on in your life. We just have to give him the opportunity to listen. I love how Psalm 34 pictures God. It says this, the Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all of their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Someone needs to hear that today. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. That guys, sometimes I know God doesn't answer all of our prayers. Sometimes it feels like he's not listening. Sometimes he doesn't take the pain away. Sometimes he doesn't take the problems away. And in those moments, we can get tempted not to pray about the things that are going on in our life. We can get tempted not to speak up, not to talk to our father. But I love how Pastor Craig Rochelle puts it when he says this, if it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. If it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. Your pain is worth praying about. And so speak up. The first thing is talk to your father, but the second thing is this, talk to your friends. Talk to your friends. Listen, we all need people in our lives that are not just there with us at our best, but that can be there for us at our worst. And when we're struggling with things, we need friends that can see through the mask of a smile that don't take I'm good for an answer that dig a little deeper. And so when I say talk to your friends, I'm saying look at your group of friends. Is there one or two people in that circle that you could trust to know everything about you? 
And when I say everything about you, I mean everything about you. Because we need friends in our lives that can do this for us. But another aspect of speaking up, another aspect of talking to your friends is this. Don't put the onus on somebody else to check on how you're doing if you've never communicated that you need help. One of the ways that we say this around here is don't hold me to an expectation you haven't clearly communicated. That if you haven't communicated to me that you need help or or that you need to be checked up on, why would you expect somebody to check up on you daily? Now listen, if we're walking around pretending that everything's okay, wearing a smile, wearing a mask, how can we expect other people to know that we're not doing okay on the inside? We have to learn to speak up. We have to learn to talk to our father. We have to learn to talk to our friends. And so what do you do when you're not okay? First you slow down. Then you speak up. But then finally the last thing is this. We reach out. We reach out. Now listen, I've met with several people that smile on the outside and struggle on the inside. As I've told you, I'm one of these people. But one of the things that I've noticed, and I hope this doesn't come off abrasive, but one of the things that I've noticed is that when we tend to struggle more inwardly, we all tend to get a little bit more selfish, don't we? And we start to ignore the problems that are going on in somebody else's life. We start to focus only on the things uh, that, that we're going through. We stop noticing uh, or finding the energy to step into other people's problems. We start to devalue the impact we can have on other people. We think to ourselves, you know, if I'm struggling with something, how in the world could I find the energy? How in the world could I find the time to step into somebody else's mess? I have my own mess to deal with. And we can begin to read verses like Galatians 6.2, which says this, share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey in the law of Christ. And we read that and we say, yes. But like, why isn't anybody else helping me struggle through the things that I'm going through? Why isn't anybody helping me with what I'm dealing with? Listen, as a church, one of the mantras that we have, one of the things we want to be defined by is this. We extend hope when life hurts. We extend hope when life hurts. We extend hope when life hurts always. That we want to be defined, we want to be remembered by the people we are continually lifting up, not the people we are continually dragging down. But don't miss this, one of the greatest things that you could do as somebody who's struggling on the inside, perhaps one of the greatest things you can do is look for opportunities to serve other people. That listen, yes, there is a reason this one comes third in the list. That we have to take the time to slow down. We have to learn to speak up and we have to take, give those things uh, the time that is necessary for them. But there comes a point in each and every one of our lives where we have to stop asking the question, what can other people do for me? And we have to start asking the question, what can I do for other people? We have to stop using how we're doing as an excuse to not help other people. And I know that's a strong statement. But listen, we extend hope when life hurts. That means we extend hope even when our life hurts. We have to learn to reach out to other people. Listen, at some point or another, we all find ourselves struggling on the inside and smiling on the outside. And as a church, we want this to be the place that you can go, the kind of place where you can stop pretending. At least then Jesus would eventually go to the cross to die for that very thing. But listen, you can't pretend at the foot of the cross. God sees through your mask. God knows that you're not doing okay. He sees the fact that we all have hurts, habits, and hangups that we deal with on a daily basis. And he saw all of those struggles. And he went to a cross and he died for you and he died for me so that someday, someday, all the anxiety, all the depression, all the emotional insecurity, all the things that we deal with on the inside, we struggle with, so that someday all of those things would go away. That listen, it's okay for you to not be okay. We just don't want to stay that way. So what do you do? What do you do when you're not okay? You slow down. You evaluate what's really going on in your life. You take a moment and you breathe. You speak up. You talk to your father. You talk to your friends. You, You make sure that you communicate the expectation that you need, that you are not okay. But then finally, you reach out. That we extend hope when life hurts no matter what. Because at the end of the day, we would rather be the kind of people that are real than the kind of people that are right. And so today to close, I just want to invite you. It's time to take off the mask. 
It's time to take off the mask because this is a place that you can stop pretending. Let's pray. God, thank you for this moment. God, I know that there's people in this room right now that are really, really struggling. God, I pray that you would give us the courage to slow down, to take a real look in the mirror and saying we are living at a pace that is unsustainable, that we weren't created to move this fast. Help us to take that time to rest and develop those rhythms in our lives. But then, God, help us to learn to speak up God, if there's somebody in this room right now, if there's somebody that's watching online that is struggling on the inside, well, they have a smile on the outside. God, give them the courage to take off the mask. God, give them the courage to reach out, to speak up, to talk to you, to talk to their friends. God, it's okay to not be okay. Then finally, God, help us to be the kind of people that reach out. Help us not to be so consumed with what we're going through that we miss opportunities to serve other people. God, we want to be the kind of church, we want to be the kind of people that extend hope when life hurts. That means we extend hope even when our life hurts, God. Help us to see people as you see people. God, we love you. We're grateful for Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to go ahead and transition us into a time of response. And very simply, uh, we never want to come to this place, listen to somebody talk, and leave exactly the same. That we want to give you an opportunity to respond. And today, I just want to give you uh, two different ways that you can do that. The first one is this. I recognize that not everybody in this room, not everybody who's watching online, has made an intentional step to follow Jesus that they haven't made him the Lord of their life, that they uh, haven't made him their savior. But listen, if you want to know what it feels like to live a life where you don't have to pretend, where you don't have to wear a smile around every single day of your life, if that's something you're interested in, we'd love to invite you to something next week. You see, next week we're going to be having an open baptism here at Trace Church. We've already got a lot of people signed up to do this that are going to make the step to follow Jesus, some of them for the very first time in their life. And guys, if that's something you'd like to talk about, I'm going to be in the back right after this. I'd love to have that conversation. Or if you don't have time today, I'll clear my schedule. We can talk about it this week. We'd love to help you make that decision. Or maybe for others of you, some of you have made that decision. Some of you have decided to follow Jesus and make Jesus the Lord and leader of your life. And all around the room, we have these tables with a cup of juice and a cracker. And every week, we take the opportunity to remember exactly what it is that God did for us. That we are not okay. We're not always good people. That our sin, it separates us from God, but Jesus, he gave us a way out through dying on the cross for each and every one of us, and we want to give him the time that he deserves. We want to take a moment and remember exactly what it is that God's done for us. And so maybe today, maybe this morning, that's how you respond. You take some time to remember what it is, and you take some time to talk to your father. I'm going to pray, and then you can go ahead and respond however you need to. God, once again, thank you for this moment. God, we don't want to leave exactly the same as we came. God, I know there's people listening today that have not made the intentional step to follow you. They have not been baptized. They don't know what it's like to live a life free of pretending, free of fake smiles, free of metaphorical masks. And so God, I pray you give them the courage. I pray you give them an opportunity to talk about what that would look like in their life. But God, also, we just wanna take a moment and say thank you for sending your son. But listen, we are hopeless without him that our sin has separated us from you and left us in this broken, messed up, messy world. But God, because of Jesus, you've given us a way out. So God, I pray that we take some time to remember exactly what it is you've done for us. Thank you so much for your son. And it's in his name we pray, amen.
Well, hey guys, it's Aaron. I wanted to take an opportunity to have a family moment with you really quick. If you were here last week here at Trace, you know that we kind of put a challenge out to you guys. And we talked to you how we want to plant a new church, a new Trace church, online. We know that more and more people, we're watching more and more people tune in online every single week from literally all around the world. And there was a statistic brought to us here recently that kind of elevated uh, our desire and really the burden for us to want to do this. And it was this statistic that over the next 18 months, one in five churches will close because of COVID. Let that sit. That over the next 18 months, one in five churches in America are going to close, which means more and more people are going to be tuning in online. Listen, all of us are in a moment right now, right? All of us are experiencing a moment that probably is bringing a lot of uncertainty. It's probably bringing certain amounts of stress, but we can't let this moment deter us from the mission. We are always on mission to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And right now we feel like we have an exceptional opportunity to do that online. So we want to plant an online church. Now to do that, we need to come up with $50,000 because not only do we need to upgrade our equipment and all that kind of stuff, but we're actually hiring people to help us to connect with people online so that we can get them connected to Jesus. Guys, we cannot do this without you. Every dollar makes a difference. And so I'm not the Holy Spirit and I'm just going to leave this with you that you would prayerfully consider this and ask God, God, what is it that we could do? How could we sacrifice financially right now for the sake of reaching more people for Jesus to help Trace plant this new church online? And so if you'll pray for that and then whatever God puts on your heart, bring that with you on September 13th, our anniversary where we get to celebrate that together. And hopefully we get to celebrate the fact that we met this $50,000 goal. So I'm going to leave that with you and we'll see you soon. All right, as we continue just in this moment of prayer and worship, will you guys stand with me as we close our service with just one more song, Surrender.
shout of praise and also our appreciation to Gina for leading us this morning. Will you guys thank her real quick? So uh, she'll be hanging out in the parking lot shortly after our service. So just uh, make your way out there and just, uh, again, show your appreciation. Guys, if you are looking for your next step in Christ and you want to take it here at Trace, we would love, we would love to take that uh, step with you. So you can take your connection card. It's in the seat back pocket in front of you. Take that to next steps. That's in the lobby. Just find someone with a blue shirt to get connected. You can also do that on our web uh, oop, I just about said website. No, that's right. App and website. I'm sorry. I'm all over the place. Um, guys, do not do not miss next week, September 13th, 9:30 and 11. If you guys could, you know, you guys are 11 o'clock people, so that's awesome. Come to the later service because uh, if you guys just make space at that 9:30, that's where a lot of our guests are going to be coming. So do not miss that. We would love to see you then. Hey guys, just uh, one more reminder about the mask push. We want to be giving out 4,000 masks into our local community and just what a blessing we would be to our city on a local level. And uh, next next week, guys, 9, 30, and 11, go be a trace. <laughs>